I'm Sarah Butcher, and this is The Side Comment. In this episode, Victor Kumar and Richmond Campbell discuss the evolution of morality that accompanied human evolution. I'm Victor Kumar. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy and the director of the Mind and Morality Lab at Boston University. I'm Richmond Campbell. I'm a professor of philosophy emeritus at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. We're the authors of A Better Ape, The Evolution of the Moral Mind and How It Made Us Human. In this book, we tell a story about the evolution of morality, starting with our shared ancestors with chimpanzees millions of years ago, through the birth of our species, and all the way up to the evolution of morality in modern societies. I'm sure some of you are thinking, uh, wait a second now. If you're talking about the uh, human evolution, you're going to be talking about um, not morality, but human nature and self-interest. That's what's making things happen. That's a common view that natural selection favors selfishness, but it's wrong. And we explain why in the book. To see why it's wrong, you need to begin by thinking about the evolution of human beings and one of the most important events in human evolution, which is that we got so much smarter. Our brains got bigger. But not just that, our brains got denser and more folded with more connections and more neuroplasticity. Now, the reason we got so smart is that human beings began living in larger and more complex social groups. And there was a selective advantage on individuals who were smart enough to better navigate their complex social groups because they were better able to anticipate what others would do to form plans and avoid conflict. Here's where our book comes in though. We argue that these large and complex social groups, which favored human intelligence, would not have been possible without morality. We needed capacities to feel moral emotions, to care about each other. And we needed capacities to follow norms, to follow norms ourselves and also hold each other responsible to these norms. So we needed morality to live in these large groups. And it was only because of morality then that human beings evolved to be more and more intelligent. Morality was crucial to human evolution. I'm sure many of our listeners are now asking themselves, isn't morality anchored in religion? Where does religion come in? Yes, that's a good thought. Many people think that morality is grounded in religion, but we argue that that's not true in the book. In fact, morality predates religion by millions of years. Chimpanzees and other social animals have the same capacities for sympathy and loyalty that make human morality and cooperation possible in our species. That said, religion did play an extremely important role in prehistorical moral evolution. So what I want you to do to understand that is think back to tens, perhaps 100,000 years ago. This is a period of time where humans left Africa, they migrated to the other continents, and they outcompeted and ultimately led to the extinction of other human species, such as Neanderthals. Humans make it to South Asia 70,000 years ago, to Australia an astonishing 50,000 years ago, and they colonize North America and South America all within a couple of thousand years. How did they do this? How did they outcompete other human species? How did they colonize the entire world? Well, key reason is the evolution of tools and technology. Humans invented things like spears and spear throwers. Also, bow and arrows probably date to this period of time. Just to give you one more example, humans, our species, were the only human species that invented sewing needles, which they used to produce seamed clothing, which offered more reliable protection from the elements. So this period of time was when there was an explosion of tools and technology, but it was also a period where humans also had an explosion of knowledge. You don't see that in the archeological record, but we must have had a lot of knowledge to produce these tools and know how to use them in different environments. Now, here's the key idea in our book, which is that religious morality was really important to this important event in human evolution. This is a period of time where we start to live in larger groups, in what some people call tribes, not just small groups of 100, 150 people, but groups of groups that were linked together by ethnicity and religion. Because humans lived in tribes, they had what Joseph Henrik calls a larger collective brain. There were more people to generate new ideas refine old ideas, and put ideas together in new ways. That's how they gained all this new knowledge and technology. But we argue that religious morality was necessary for this to happen. Religion enabled us to expand our moral circles, to think of one another 
as part of the same family, descended from the same mythic ancestors. And so it's only because of religion and religious morality that roughly 100,000 years ago, we were able to generate the large collective brains that were necessary to produce amazing new knowledge and technology. Religion and religious morality were really key to prehistorical moral evolution. Now, I know that some people agree that religion plays an important role in morality, but if you think that's true, you might also believe that reason doesn't play much of a role in morality. And this is something that psychologists like Jonathan Haidt have argued. Yeah, there's lots of views in the literature, but there are two dominant views. On the side of science, there is the view that when it comes to morality, it's human emotion that really calls the shots. It's what we uh, feel in our intuitions. On the other hand, philosophers have traditionally, uh, there are lots of exceptions, but traditionally the dominant view has been that reason is really critical for knowing the difference between right and wrong. In our book, we reject both of these views. We think that emotion is important, reasoning is important, and they are interdependent. They work together. How does that happen? Well, it's a complicated story that we tell in the, in the book, but I think an example might bring it home very nicely. And I'll use a famous example introduced by Peter Singer from about 50 years ago. Suppose you're standing by a shallow pond and you see a toddler start to wander into the pond. The parents are nowhere nearby and you can just walk into the pond and save the toddler from drowning, but you're gonna ruin your new suit. What should you do? Well, most people will have a very powerful emotional response to this. They'll just walk into the pond and save the child, the hell with the suit. However, in this case, you might say, well, you're just proving the point that emotion plays a dominant role. But now you might ask, as Peter Singer did, what about the person that you can save on the other side of the world by spending no more money than it took to buy the new suit? Shouldn't you save the child that you don't know across the world? And you might think, well, a lot of good people might say yes, but it turns out that quite a few people are moved by this reasoning, which we call consistent reasoning. There seems to be no morally relevant difference between saving the child far away and saving the child uh, right before you. So this is a case of the interdependence of emotion and reasoning to advance morality. We also discuss how morality plays, including the emotions that are involved in morality, play a major role in complex knowledge, because complex knowledge involves groups working together, and they can't work together successfully, taking seriously each other's objections when they're trying to solve a problem, being truthful, giving the other room to raise objections without morality. So throughout our book, these two things are interdependent. Right, so that's how moral reasoning is central to moral thought, and it's also how morality supports reasoning. At this point, I think the audience might be wondering about moral progress. We've talked about how morality evolves, but does morality also get better? Well, this is, of course, a very, very big uh, question, but it is uh, squarely in the, in the center of our book. In our view, it is impossible to make global judgments about moral progress. And we argued this in detail. I won't repeat the arguments right now, except to say that one problem with making global judgments about how much progress there is across the globe a million years ago or a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago is that there are all sorts of things that are hard to compare, including more people as being recognizable, equal moral beings is, uh, is a matter of progress. But if they're equal moral beings, but some are advantaged more than others in socioeconomic terms, and that is actually encouraged by the moral development, that seems like a moral regress. How do you weigh these two things? We don't think it's possible to answer that question. So what do we do is focus on local cases, local examples, and examples that have happened recently where we know a lot about them, and we try to analyze what allowed this clear case of moral progress to occur. What is a clear case? 
Well, there, there are, there's more than one, but let me just focus on one. The rejection of chattel slavery, that is slavery that involves treating another person just as a thing, so you can sell them as a piece of, uh, of a property, and they have no, no moral standing whatsoever. This was quite prevalent not many uh, years ago, and about 1780 in Britain, when the majority of people were in favor of having uh, slave trade and chattel slavery, the discussion began. The ones who wanted to abolish slavery were in the minority, but about 50 years later, the picture entirely changed. How did this happen? It happened, we think, through three major factors, uh, which occur in other cases of local moral progress. One is social structure. The social structure in Britain at the time allowed interchange of information, democratic discussion, both in the pub, in churches, in newspapers, in books, in town hall meetings. There was a great deal of chance to exchange different views and argue about important issues. Another factor is that knowledge was gained through this process so that people who thought that African slaves were less intelligent than Caucasian people discovered that there was no clear evidence that that is true, nor that they were less in moral character, were more savage in their disposition and so on. So knowledge and social structure and morality in the sense of just the core basic morality that has been around for some time, as we argue in the book, these three things interact to form a positive feedback loop, which allows for change. And this, we think, applies to other cases. Yes. In conclusion, we think that in order to make moral progress in the future and resist moral regress, we need to better understand how moral progress unfolded in the past. That's how we can become a better ape.